So my name is Michelle Johnson and I have over 16 years of working in the healthcare industry. A port, small portion of that was working in a facility setting and then I went on to home health and then have kind of found, I feel like my personal calling, which is hospice, which is my heart. And, um, but I really feel like I took the appropriate steps to get to where I am today because I believe without having the experience in a facility setting and in the home health setting, um, I think my knowledge of hospice would be a little bit one-sided, but because I kind of got to grow and learn um, patient care in a third facility setting and the home health and their goals, it really allowed me to be a better helper to those who were advanced in illness and needing a higher level of care. So, but I wanted to touch on um, hospice is actually a type of home health. I think traditionally when we hear the word home health, we think of home health, a nurse, a therapist, somebody come into the home, trying to set some goals for our loved one to get better. Is that what you guys think about home health? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sometimes there's another type of home health, which is a non-medical type of home health. So if you say home health, it sometimes people think that it refers to a personal caregiver service. Um, I, you know, sometimes they call it a sitter service, but we don't really want to call it a sitter service, right? Mm -hmm. We want to call it a per personal caregiver, but that's a non-medical type of care. So, um, and it, we just call it a non-medical um, type of care where they are going to be mo for focusing more on, you know, home home things like cooking and cleaning and thing, baby bathing, things like that, but it's not medically related. And then the other type of home health is hospice care. It is a type of home care that we provide. So um, I'm just gonna start with home health in general. And, and this little bit of information is from, um, according to medicare.gov, okay? So um, home health is a wider range of services that can be given in your home for an illness or an injury. Um, it is usually less expensive, maybe more convenient, and at times it can be just as effective as if you went to a hospital or a nursing facility, okay? Um, well, what does, home, what does a home health nurse do on a, like when they come to your home? A traditional home health, like a medical home health, will send a nurse, right? The, the nurse usually takes vitals, she looks at the symptoms of the patient, and she looks at the conditions of what's going on. She can help with any medications and treatments. She's most, if not all times, I would say she's all times, she is do, developing a plan of care. And she usually takes that plan of care and develops it with the physician. Now it might be the patient's primary care physician, it might be the wound care physician, it might be a pulmonary physician, it might be um, a neurologist, you know, it's gonna be with a, with a provider that she is coming up with a care plan. It used to be called a 485, I think it still might be called a 485, but there's an actual care plan where they set goals. So um, the goal is going to be to try to set some goals and try to meet those goals. So it could be the nurse is assessing a wound, right? Um, but then there's also other um, people that can come in and assist with home health that's not a nurse. It could be a physical therapist. Um, so physical therapy will come in and they'll work and follow that same care plan and they'll set goals. Okay, well, mom fell, she's not walking, she's had surgery. So now mom is gonna set some goals. We're gonna try to get mom up out of the bed. We're gonna try to get mom walking four feet within the next two or three weeks. So the goal is to try to help mom set a goal and reach the goal. Or dad, I'm saying mom and using that as an example. Um, or sister, or whoever, maybe, you know, ourselves. So, but just the patient, the individual. So, but the primary goal of help, home health is to provide care and services to for the person to um, remain in the home for as long as possible, right? That's the goal for home health in general. Um, and that even means hospice. We're, the goal for hospice is to help that patient or individual remain in the home for as long as possible. So, but when we're specifically talking to home health, not hospice related and not non-medical related, the patient must be homebound. So for traditional home health, the patient must be homebound. Now, what are the exceptions to that rule? Um, the patient can go to church, they can get their, their religious services, they can go to you know, their synagogue or whatever their religious purposes are, they can go do that. 
Um, that's a necessary, a necessi necessity, sorry, I can't get that out today. Um, also, they can go um, pick up prescriptions. They can do the things that are medically ne necessary. Um, they can go to doctor's appointments. But the things that you traditionally won't see a home health doing or going to the bingo hall for entertainment, going to the casino, right? Going to do things for enjoyment because Medicare kind of says, look, it needs to be a taxing effort for this patient to get out. Um, this is a service that's provided because this patient can't really get to physical therapy. They can't get to doc their doctor as frequently. So, but they do need to go see their doctor to have this care plan. Okay. Um, so, so we talked about physical therapy. There's also occupational therapy. And then there's also speech therapy. And you'll see speech therapy a good bit with um, Alzheimer's patients because they maybe have had an incident and they're learning or they're swallowing, they're doing some swallowing studies, tests, things like that. So um, we talked a little bit about non-medical home care. Um, these are, they're caregivers, but it's, it's traditional. Sometimes they're coming in four hour increments. I think that's the most traditional, mm -hmm. it's, it's four hour increments. And, and usually it's private pay. You're paying them privately. Um, however, in the state of Louisiana, there there is a certain financial. If the patient has meets the financial criteria, you, the patient may qualify for Medicaid. And medic and it uh, over some time, it does take some time. But you have, traditionally, the patients I see have to get on a waiting list, and sometimes that takes six months. Um, could be, take less, maybe take more. But um, so the, if there's financial criteria that's met, maybe Medicaid can pay for some of those services. Also, um, a lot of times individuals have long-term care insurance policy and they can qualify through their long-term care policy to reimburse them. Um, and then the last that I kind of know of is some VA assistance. If we're a veteran um, or maybe married to a veteran, the patient may qualify for um, some personal home care through the VA or through the VA assistance program that they have. So does that give you all a good understanding of like home health in general? Mm -hmm. So. The goal of home health is to get that patient better. Um, and I think that is the, the hardest part. I think with some of the families that I see, especially when the patient has an illness like Alzheimer's or advanced disease like cancer, they're setting goals trying to get the patient better, but all too often it's just not the reality, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I was, t and so it makes it hard for the home health to be able to continue to bill for services because when they do that care plan, it's only good for so many days, right? Um, or a time frame, And then it may be based off the insurance. So if you have a certain insurance, so you have Medicare, which is the primary payer for most home health, but then there's some al um, alternative plans like um, supplement plans or it, it there's another word with an A that I can't advantage. think of. Advantage plan, that's it. I couldn't get another word out of my mind. But the advantage plans. So the advantage plans, to my understanding, they kind of set the number of visits, the pace for the home health to use. So they might say, okay, you get this many visits. And so if the home health gets that referral, they're going, okay, I have this many visits and I can do this many nurse visits, this many therapy visits, this many OT visits, right? And so sometimes you may talk with your home health person and say, okay, look, you know, we really want to focus on mom's physical therapy. Let's, let's work on that, right? Let's focus on that. I can handle whatever this is going. I can handle mom's meds. Let's focus on our therapy. And again, it's working with the doctor to see that the doctor is making that best care plan as well. But, um, so some of the things that I talked with a couple of home healths around town is with Alzheimer's patients, sometimes they're teachable, but a lot of times they're not teachable right? You teach them something and it gets forgotten very easily. And so if, if I'm a home health agency and I'm trying to set a care plan and I'm not meeting goals, I'm only going to be able to set so many care plans before it's not a permissible service anymore, right? So a lot of times home health say, you know, well, I can't teach the patient, but I can teach the caregiver things on how to help take care of the patient and, and keep the patient in their home as long as possible. So you can ask your doctor if you can have a home health come and teach you about whatever it is you want to help mom with or dad with. Um, or there might be home health coming out to take care of a wound. If there's a wound that maybe has, a, um, because the patient was stationary for a certain amount of time or maybe wasn't turning, things like that. 
Um, or they, home health might can provide Foley care, which is like a nursing care to, to care for a Foley catheter. Um, also, home health can help um, patients and their loved ones um, with safety, Look, kind of do a safety check in the home and make sure that the home is as, as safe as it can be for that loved one. Um, often they can help with fall prevention, right? They can, they can say, okay, well, mom's having falls. If mom's teachable, maybe we can teach her if she's gonna fall, this is the best way to fall, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and then there's just other things that the doctor, the doctor have, may, may have specific needs. Um, so we can also educate, um, home health can also educate the caregiver about a disease process. And then also wound care, they can educate the, the family and the patient on the wound care. So, when, so sometimes when you have home health for your loved one, it gets discharged within two months or four months. And you're like, well, my loved one traditionally isn't better or they're better for a short time and then they have a med change or they have a new wound. And so when there's new medications, if the home health's been discharged and you feel like mom or dad needs home health again, the individual needs home health again, you can also contact that doctor or their home health provider and say, you know what, we have some new medicines, new medicines that we need to learn about, or we have some new, a new wound that we need to focus on, or we have some new symptoms. There's a new disease process that I'm not familiar with and I wanna learn about it. So these are things you can ask your doctor about and then, or ask your, a local home health um, advocate about, okay? So, um, and again, some of those patients are teachable, so we can teach those. So the next thing um, I want to talk to you about is, is I'm going to give you a little hospice 101, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so this is, so my objective for this next part of our conversation is just kind of explain the hospice care philosophy, um, to discuss the goals of hospice care, and then identify qualification or hospice care eligibility, and then discuss covered services underneath the hospice benefit, and then state our payer sources. So. Our philosophy, well the hospice philosophy is a care that focuses on providing palliative care to patients with life-limiting illnesses and focusing on palliating the patient's pain and other symptoms, attending to their family, their loved ones and their loved ones' emotional and spiritual support and the needs and providing their support for their caregivers. So it's a little bit more than medical care, right? Um, and you, so, you notice I use that word palliative, right? Um, and I'll touch a little bit more on that, but I wanna say that hospice will always be palliative, but palliative does not always mean hospice. You, I hear the word palliative being used a lot and loosely a little bit recently. So, um, but the word palliative truly is comfort. It just means to do something the most comfortable way. But um, fun fact, Hospice, can anybody tell me kind of where it was derived from? Anybody have any idea? Mm -hmm. So from what I understand, um, back in the good old days, a long, long time ago, I believe it's when there was a plague going on, there were some nuns that were being very hospitable with the plague and they were going out and comforting patients and medicating them and they were providing, but the, their approach was just me coming to the families, helping the patients, helping the the situation and so that's how the word hospice came about they were truly treating okay. a disease process and and it was when there was a plague going on maybe in san antonio i should have brushed up on that sorry <laughs> but i, I want to say it was something that was maybe in the san antonio area i'll have to look that up and get back to you you're recording me it's probably all wrong <laughs> mm -hmm. um but so what is hospice so we are considered the model for quality compassionate care for people who are facing a life-limiting illness. Um, we provide expert medical care, pain management, emotional support, and this support is expressly tailored to patients and their families' needs and their wishes. And we focus on comfort care and the quality of life rather than the curative measures, okay? So would you think that you need to be homebound to be on hospice? They can be. They can be, but it is a requirement. No, because sometimes we often have patients that are very young that are diagnosed with advanced diseases like cancer and CHF. 
and those patients, even though they may not be a candidate for any curative measures, they still can have the best quality of life. And if that means getting out and spending quality time with family and friends, then they're permitted to do so, right? But we're just managing their end-stage disease and their, and their pain. So um, the goals of hospice. So um, our goal is to see that it's a self-determined life closure. Um, our goal is to see that the patient is allowed a natural death. And our goal is to make sure that that patient is comfortable and has a peaceful dying experience. And then our goal is also to help with grieving and and because that's a real thing, right? Um, so what are some of the common myths about hospice? Well, one of them is a patient must be in the final stages of dying to be eligible to be for hospice months care. When you yeah. get cancer. Yeah. Um, and then, um, and you just said the primary reason that we get a hospice referral is cancer. That's the number one reason. But it's not the number one cause of death, is it? Right. Who can tell me what is? Heart failure, heart disease. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. So, uh, but that's so, uh, that's very interesting, right? And what percentage of dying patients do you think actually gets hospice care? Very few. You, you learned it. <laughs> <laughs> so as of right now, the average is 52%. It, um, it's up a little bit from 48%. During COVID, it's kind of dropped a little bit. Mm -hmm. and, and the true fact is that more women than men get hospice care nationwide. So that's an interesting fact. Huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the Medicare hospice benefit covers six months of health care and only care. Well, that's not necessarily the truth. Like she just said, some patients live longer than six months. So um, hospice care is just for elderly patients or just for cancer patients. That's not true. Um, and then if a patient elects hospice service, they can no longer see their doctor. Baloney. <laughs> not true. Mm -hmm. um, so what are the Medicare qualifications? Well, let me touch on one or two of these things because if a patient elects hospice service, they can no longer see their primary physician. I can't speak for other hospice agencies, but I can speak for the one I work for. I'm not gonna say, but when we have a patient that is on services, we do approach their, if the patient wants, sometimes the patient prefers not to. Sometimes the patient's like, I don't want you, I, I want a new doctor. Um, but often they're like, well, I really love Dr. ABC and I really want him to be involved in my care. Um, and, but sometimes that physician has a practice and he's taking call for six, 10 other doctors and he really doesn't want to see phone calls at 10 o'clock at night, but he's worked with us in the past or trust our medical consultants that we have on our team. And, and he really says, you know what? I would love to follow you, Ms. Smith. However, I do have my practice and I trust these guys and I'm gonna allow them to kind of to take charge of your care and work with me and keep me updated on how it's going. Um, but so we, we say, look, but if you wanna see your doctor in six months or a year and just do a general wellness visit to see how things are going, you're more than welcome to do that. So that's how we do things. Um, but, so we, but we have to be very careful, right? Because if we go to Dr. ABC and he's writing prescriptions and we're writing prescriptions, that's, you know, we were just talking about that a minute ago. So you know, we wanna make sure that there's one care plan and that, 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 that there's not any mistakes in that process, right? So we have to be very careful communicating that. Um, so it says the Medicare hospice benefit covers only six months of care. So a patient, we, the way I like to say it to my, to my families that I talk with is mom has, a, mom has an illness and we are thinking that because of this illness, mom is at risk to pass away because of this and because of that and because of this. And so is mom at risk to pass away in six months? Yes, but is she going to pass away in six months? Only time will tell us that, right? But um, I will say that, you know, I don't, you know, typically think there's anything that hospice is going to do to hasten the patient's life, right? So that's at least, that's how I feel. So, um, all right, so what are the qualifications? Well, there does have to be a certification. Um, there does, the hospice usually has a doctor 
And then the patient's primary care doctor, they kind of communicate and say, look, this patient has this, this, and this, and we think because of these things that this patient is at risk to pass away in six months. So, um, so there's a certification from an attending physician or a hospice medical director that the patient has a life expectancy of six months or less, and the patient or the patient's representative elective palliative care or comfort care rather than curative care. So the patient has to say, okay, you know, my goal is really to be comfortable and I'm not really looking for aggressive treatment. So if it's a cancer patient, right? Traditionally, these patients have already sought out their treatment. They've already done a treatment plan and they either chose not to do it or they did the treatments and it, working, it wasn't working or maybe it wasn't working enough to make a difference in the cancer. The cancer was growing faster or sometimes the cancer treatments do more harm than good, you know, and the patients are like, no, I don't want to deal with these side effects, right? So um, it's really up to the patient when they are ready to kind of allow um, those non-aggressive measures and focus on more of a comfort care measure. But that doesn't mean we give up, guys, okay? We still treat symptoms, right? So I want that to be very, very known. We, if a patient's come to us with cancer or Alzheimer's disease, we don't want them to pass away from something that was treatable and by non-aggressive treatment. And this might be antibiotics because it was a wound or that was infected or something, you know, this is, there. we treat the things that we can treat, especially when it comes to things that are um, agitating and pain and things like that. We wanna try to find a way to give that patient the best quality of life. So we're not just gonna let them suffer because they have some sort of infection, right, typically. So, uh, so the, and there also has to be like a signed election, kind of a statement stating that, hey, the, my goal is comfort care. And, that, um, and it kind of explains whether Medicare is gonna cover the treatment or what, what the insurance will pay um, if there's an insurance. So, um, so diagnosis, well, what type of diagnosis do we see? We see Alzheimer's, we see that a good bit. We see um, circulatory heart, cancer, respiratory, stroke, kidney disease. Um, we also, I'm just gonna pass over some of this. So 59% of the patients that we see are 85 and older. Um, the, the ages below that are 75 to 84, and then um, 65 to 74 is kind of like that other category, and then the, the youngest is less than 65. So, but 85 and older is gonna be the most of the population that we see. Some of this is not relatable. <laughs> so what, are, um, what does hospice cover? It covers four levels of care, and that would be home hospice, hospice in the home. That would be um, a facility with hospice, like sometimes patients can go into a nursing facility and have hospice. Um, there's respite care provided on hospice. And then the last thing is GIP level of care, general inpatient level of care. And I like to say it, people are like, well, why is there so many levels? Well, when you go into a hospital, you have different levels, right? You have the regular room, you've got the ER room, you've got an ICU room, you have a surgery room. Well, when you go into the surgery room, you don't just stay there forever, right? When you get done with surgery, a lot of times you go into the ICU. And traditionally, when you're ICU, you don't stay in the ICU. They want to get you back to a regular room, make sure you're stable, and then they'll get you home. Well, hospice is kind of the same thing. We want, most patients would prefer to pass away in their home, right? But we are, are now, I mean, there are people working longer and longer and longer. The retirement age is getting higher and higher and higher. And back in the good old days, a lot of women didn't work, right? And, um, and there are a lot of family members didn't work um, at a certain age, they were retired. And so they could really care for their aging population and their family. And now people are just working longer and they're not able to take care of their loved ones because they're having to work to meet their personal needs. So um, we, we do have situations where patients do require a nursing facility for hospice care. Um, but then we have some that are like, we have loved ones taken care of 
in their home by their daughter or their sister or even their mother, okay? And, but sometimes they have personal things go on. They might need a knee surgery. They might have a oral surgery. They might have a daughter getting married and they're going on a cruise or something special to where that patient needs a respite, that family needs a respite. And so we pay for a short stay in a facility so that family member can take a respite. Um, and then the last one's general inpatient care. And that would be um, kind of like when you're in the hospital and you need the ICU. It's very similar to that, except it's on the hospice side. That's when we've done everything we can to manage the symptoms in the home. And they're just not manageable in the home. They're, ne they're needing some medical treatment uh, around the clock. Um, things like if, because they have multiple wounds and they really need to have those wounds managed. Or maybe we are treating the symptoms at home for shortness of breath but the, the symptoms are not getting under control and maybe we need someone intravenously what, to treat that intravenously. And um, some, so uncontrollable shortness of breath, uncontrollable pain, uncontrollable nausea. So when we're doing things at home and we just can't get it under control, it's typically less than 5%, probably even less than that, that where you have symptoms that can't be managed, right, immediately. Um, and a lot of times that is in what I call the patient's actively dying phase when those patients are very symptomatic and they're kind of needing that more one-on-one um, -on -one level of care for an extended period of time by a nurse. And um, a lot of times family's there and we can teach them and we can, we, medicine is amazing. We have all types of medicine and all types of routes to give medicine in the home where Many years ago, we didn't have that type of tech, you know, I guess technology to have this type of medicine. So, um, but there's, so the need for GIP is becoming less and less, and, um, but it is still available. So um, you guys have access, so if a patient comes up, they have access to the entire team. And I'm gonna go over what that team looks like. Um, the hospice often pays for medications that are related to the illness. And then also they pay for equipment and supplies, like a hospital bed and oxygen and a fall mat. I mean, if the patient's falling, there's all kinds of things that the hospice can pay for. They can pay for wedges if the patient's getting a wound or, you know, because we want to turn mom. So um, also, if there, sometimes the hospice pays for therapy if it's needed. Um, traditionally, that's, all, that's not done for extended periods of time. Sometimes it's because the patient has found an improvement and we wanna see if they can tolerate some of that therapy and maybe go graduate from hospice and go back to home health and do physical therapy a little longer. Sometimes we get it wrong. Sometimes the patient was just having something more acute than it was long-term and sometimes the hospice gets in there and we start making a difference and the patient kind of has a reversal of symptoms. And at that point we can kind of talk to the family and say, look, I think we maybe did this a little early. Do we want, what is our goal now, right? And so I think we can definitely talk about that. But um, So again, um, GIP is usually used for crisis care. And then um, sometimes it can be provided in the home. Sometimes the home, the home hospice nurse will actually stay for hours to get those symptoms under control. Um, but she has to be able to document appropriately for Medicare to pay for that level of care. Um, so, okay. A lot of this is just some numbers that you guys really don't even probably need to care about. Um, so, what does the hospice team look like? Well, we're a team of physicians, spiritual counselors, social workers, bereavement counselors, we have hospice aides, we have therapists, we have nurses, and then sometimes we have volunteers that wanna come out. Um, so the physician services, that's gonna be a primary doctor or, or, or a hospice medical director, and they are both responsible for the palliation and management of the illness. So the nursing services will provide direct care to the patient they're gonna coordinate and oversight all of the patient care services. My nurses meet with our doctors regularly to discuss the patient's plan of care. And they're, um, 
can have constant, they can call that doctor pretty much anytime, right? Um, so they have a guidance and a support system for their patients, and they inform the patients and the physicians of all the changes that are happening, and they provide education on the prescribed treatments and the medication and the symptoms of what's happening with the end of life, right? So, especially when it comes to end of life, your traditional home health nurse is gonna be more familiar with your diseases, but when a hospice nurse, all she sees is end-stage Alzheimer's, all she sees is end-stage cancer, that's gonna be her, her core of what she is, because she sees it all day, every day, and so she is super duper experienced, or he is super duper experienced. We have male and female nurses, right? So, um, hospice aides. So our aides are gonna be that personal caregiver that helps you with bathing, grooming, hygiene, toileting, incontinence. They're able to provide emotional and spiritual support. And then a social worker. A social worker can help with facility placement, counseling, assist in families, assist in navigating end of life planning, um, assist and provide education on advanced directives. Then there's the spiritual care. The spiritual needs of the patients and family to help work with other professional and clergy to staff to, re, um, to resolve spiritual or pastoral concerns, to work alongside bereavement coordinators and assist with counseling, and to assist the patient or family with the end of life planning. I wanna say something about spiritual care. Sometimes what I see is that we have our churches that we're involved in, we have our spiritual services that we're involved in, but the thing about some spiritual services is that some of these groups and organizations are very small, right? And sometimes we want to talk to somebody that doesn't know any of our other loved ones or our personal friends, and we just want a safe place to talk to. So a lot of times a hospice spiritual person can be a safe place for that family to have a, a non-biased approach to what's happening. So um, bereavement coordinators. So we actually keep in touch with our families up to 13 months after the loved ones have passed away. Um, just to um, help coordinate and facilitate any um, grief um, support programs that we might can get them involved in, to con con conduct assessments for the bereavement and help determine if there's any appropriate services, and then also to provide, to provide that. Um, so the volunteers are here to support um, and assist with maybe a household chore or running an errand. Um, so there are volunteers for that. Um, let's see. Talk a little bit about the equipment already. I'm going to pass that over. Um, so the medications. So do we pay for all medications? Typically hospice will not, but we'll pay for the ones that are related to the illness. So um, for instance, vitamins, a lot of times those are over the counter. You know, we probably wouldn't pay for some of those but we would pay for anything if it's a you know heart failure patient a lot of times they're on oxygen so we would pay for like the breathing treatments and the oxygen and the things that go along with that and the medicines to help keep that those symptoms under control so anything that's helped supporting the disease process of why the patient is at risk to pass away so who pays for hospice medicare um medicare does even a lot of times when they have a um, advantage plan. Um, the advantage plan kind of says, you know what, we reverted all to Medicare and, and Medicare pays for everything. So earlier when you were hearing me talk about those 12 visits, 10 visits that, you know, that the advantage plan may give the family or the patient, um, we get, we don't have to worry about that as much. We get a daily rate from Medicare and we can choose based off of your the communication that we need for the care plan on how many visits the patient needs. So um, we're also paid by Medicaid, um, private insurance, um, and other managed care organizations. Um, sometimes we're paid by private payment or self-pay. And then, um, so why hospice? It's patient-centered, it's holistic care, it's when comfort is the priority, it's home-based care, it's team-based care, it's family inclusive, and it focuses on the quality of life. Home-based care is probably the biggest thing 
that I see for my Alzheimer's and dementia patients because it is so hard to get our loved ones out of the house sometimes, right? It is so just getting to whatever necessary appointment we need can present so many challenges. And even when we get home, we're still presented sometimes with challenges or we're trying to redirect or we're trying to resettle things down. You're looking at me like you have, but you know exactly what I'm talking about. You don't do. <laughs> it can be such a challenge. So, so in summary, our care focuses on comfort care, not curative, and it requires an expected prognosis of six months or less. Um, or a hospice is provided in any place that the patient calls home. It's covered by Medicare, Medicaid, or the private insurance. And the care is usually individualized to the patient. So um, there is a book that I just want to tell you about. Um, it is called Hard Choices for Loving People. Have any of you ever heard of that book? Um, it is by Hank Dunn, and it really talks about compassionate, well, it is a compassionate guide that helps patients and their families when they're having to make end-of-life medical decisions. So it talks, it gives kind of a non-biased approach on feeding tubes. Um, uh, you know, aggressive antibiotics, um, IV antibiotics, um, resuscitation. And it kind of tells you, you know, a feeding tube has these pluses, but these are also some of the risks that are associated with it, you know? Um, and then it kind of tells you, you know, with disease process, you might consider feeding tube for this, but you may want to use caution when the feeding tube, when the valve's not working, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's a really good guide, but because it, 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 it's just to help people who are having to make hard choices, and it's not always easy making a hard choice when you're a loving person, right? And um, so my biggest thing is if your loved one is still cognitive, go ahead and have those hard conversations now. Because personally, I didn't really get to share with y'all a little bit. How am I doing on time? Okay, so I got a few more minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I didn't really get to share with you a little bit about my story, you know. Um, dealt with dementia and Alzheimer's. I, don't, I, you know, I encountered that as a child. My parents were divorced, and their parents were divorced. So um, grandparents, and they were both remarried, and my grandparents were both divorced and remarried. So I had an abundance of grandparents in my life, okay. I still have one grandparent remaining. <laughs> um, but I had an abundance of grandparents in my life. and and. There were three who suffered with dementia. And um, I have a funny story. Uh, I'll never forget one, one time. I just got married. I was 23. Grandpa was sitting on his porch. And I go out and I'm sitting with Grandpa. And I'm like, hey, he's like, how are you enjoying being married? And I said, oh, Grandpa, I love being married. It's great. She, he goes, is it better than your first marriage? And I'm like, Grandpa, I've never been married before. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been married before. Yes, you have that McDonald's fella. Uh -huh. I said, Grandpa, I said, Andy McDonald? He said, yes. I said, that's my daddy. <laughs> so he was talking about with my mom, who went, married my dad. But the funny thing is my mom married my dad when she was, you know, very young. And so they did get a divorce shortly after they were married. But then my, um, she married my, I, I still call my stepdad my dad. He's been my dad since I was like five. So um, she married my other dad. And I got a couple of dads. <laughs> So, um, and so he was, in his mind, that was his reality, right? His reality was, I was his daughter, even though he kind of, his story was just so muddy to him, right? He had, he was on point, but not on point. He knew pieces of each story, but he was really getting them mixed together. But I'll just never forget, like, that was his reality, that I was his, kind of his daughter, but kind of not. So that was my first, I think, true experience where I was like, okay, this is this is interesting um and then actually i lost a loved one um, over a year ago it's it's right around mother's day last year um and she was starting to get some very clear signs of dementia and um we'd go to the hospital because she she also had some other medical illnesses but we would go to the hospital pretty regularly i think she was starting to have some heart heart stuff happening and she would wake up in the hospital. She would faint, pass out, and she'd wake up in the hospital mad as a hornet. She did not want to be there. 
did not want to be there. And my medical, one of my medical doctors that work with me on a pretty regular basis, I saw him coming out of her room as I was going into her room. And I'm like, oh, he got to meet my grandma. <laughs> <laughs> I said, how was that? He said, yep. He asked me why, she asked me why I was asking her so many questions and why I needed to know all of her business. <laughs> and she was ready to go. She did not want to be there. She did not need to be there in her opinion. And I'm like, but we don't even know what's wrong with you, right? Like we don't even know what's wrong with you. So that happened a couple of times. And then one of the last times we went to the hospital, she told me, she's like, hey, Michelle, she, after she had fussed at several other people and totally embarrassed all these people that I know so very well working <laughs> with working in hospice care at this hospital quite often um I, she's like hey will you look up there and she pointed to the clock and she's like will you change the channel on that tv and I'm like yeah okay and then I got to see where sometimes the westerns that she would watch they were almost like they were her reality you know, mm -hmm. she would talk about somebody and then I realized, okay, she was talking about the TV, things that were happening with the TV. But she ended up having a stroke, guys. Mm -hmm. She ended up having a stroke. And um, I, we were faced with some really hard decisions because her chances of surviving a stroke surgery were minimal. Mm -hmm. And then they told me if she did survive, she was gonna require a feeding tube. And um, mm -hmm. this is somebody who was easily agitated. And the minute she woke up, she pulled everything off. So chances of her having many deficits from her stroke, from the surgery, if she survived, and then having had a feeding tube that was not gonna be in very long, I'm just gonna be honest with you, right? Mm -hmm. um, we had to make some really hard decisions. And so, but we, we knew what her wishes are. We knew that she did not want to have her life prolonged artificially in that stage, right? Um, she would tell you many times she is ready. She was ready for the next stage, right? Um, so, and then I had another uh, another grandparent who really was having some dementia issues, stopped eating, like we just got real weak, real sick, and some amazing doctors um, got him eating again and got him stronger, and he was leaving Taco Bell, and when him and him and his bride were jumping you know they were kind of walking off the curb she went to grab his hand and he pulled away because he's independent right like he's in, he pulled away and he stepped off that curb and lost his balance and fell and hit his head mm. and um this was a strong independent man business owner it was really hurting me to watch him lose his independence and i just did not want to see somebody who had done so much in life suffer that way right and um, especially with the not eating, but yeah, I was so happy for all the new things, but then, and so it was just such a bitter thing to like lose him so quickly when we were just starting to see some improvement. Mm -hmm. But then the joy was, he's not gonna have prolonged suffering, right? Mm -hmm. And so it was just a really interesting place for me to navigate that situation as well. So um, it was, it was, it was hard. It was hard, but it, I think that I want to encourage you guys just to kind of have those conversations with your family and your individual that you're caring for. And you guys are already staying so educated, 